expect to suck. People expect to be not great, but you expect to be good. You know, like if you're starting a podcast, you don't expect to be Joe Rogan. Expect not to be A plus, but you don't expect to suck. Right. You think I'm going to be like a B, a B minus, you know, like I, I'll be okay. I can ask questions. I know I kind of know what good looks like. And then you go and you start thinking about your first one or maybe even do your first one and, and it sucks. Like, oh my God, I didn't even know what to say. I pressed record on the camera and I froze. Yeah. I suck. And we turn that as I, I suck at a skill to I suck as a person. Yes. And so just expect to suck at the beginning. Whatever it is that you're doing the first time, you're not going to be great at. You're going to get on a bicycle and fall over. You're going to snowboard and you're going to fall down. Why do you think your first podcast is going to be amazing? Right. Or your first page of your book or whatever, right? So that I'll tell myself too, like the permission to suck at the beginning, which then allows me to take the first step and just keep going. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I watch these videos every day because I need them for motivation. Being around successful entrepreneurs every morning helps me believe that I can do great things too. It's like your morning coffee, but for your goals, kickstarting your day with a blast of positivity. So here is a challenge for you. Try watching one video every morning for the next 30 days, and let's find out together if they help you do great things too. If you're in, leave a hashtag believe in the comments below so I can celebrate with you. So today we're gonna to learn from me and my team's take on my top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two is believe. What is the common denominator that you find, um, you know, through all these successful entrepreneurs? Uh, for me, it always comes down to belief, belief in that they can do it. Uh, now, I, might, I'm, I see the world through the lens of believe anyway. The so believe I, eyes. You know, I, <laughs> like, it just, I love a lot it. of the people who've had tons of success, like they, they shouldn't, they shouldn't, be there. Like you shouldn't be doing yeah. what you're doing from where you came from and what you went through. It's like, you shouldn't be here doing this. Like eight year old Joe is like, what are you doing? That's not possible. <laughs> and then you're here. True. That, right. And so you're already, in, you're an impossibility to younger you, let alone an impossibility like to the world. And so successful yeah. entrepreneurs just believe that this thing can happen, even though logically it doesn't make sense. And when people tell you this doesn't make sense, they're right. You know, they yeah. are right. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. make sense. And you, but you believe in yourself that you're just going to go off and do it. Um, that's the one. Two, I would say they start. They build momentum. Like they just create. They go. It, even though it doesn't make sense. They're not going to overthink it for the next 20 years before they decide. Like I'm going to go get funding. I'm going to find an option. And then poof, here comes Joe. Right? We're like, they, they didn't have that connection. They didn't know what they were doing. They just started. And then if I had a third, it'd be they, they just kept going. You know? It's like yeah. I'm not, one, one bank tells me no. I'm not going to get funding. Cool. I'm going to keep searching until I find an option. Rule number three is conquer your fears. I think anything great in life is going to come on the other side of fear. If you're only doing things that you're not afraid of at all, you're not doing anything great. If you think about the, the best things that you've done in life, things that you're most proud of, it came with a healthy dose of fear. Like you were afraid to do something and then whether it worked out or whether it didn't, like you took the step and you can be proud of that. And so anytime that you want to, you know, if you want to live a meaningful life, you want to be happy, you know, it's going to come with having fear. And I don't think it's just, I don't think you can eliminate fear. I don't think, I don't think it's actually healthy. I don't think you should be off saying, well, I have no fear. Like, no, like this fear, I recognize that I'm going to be afraid to do it. And I'm going to do it anyway, because I want to reach the other side. So for me, in my first business, I was 19 years old. Uh, I turned down a huge job to start this company. I was making $300 a month. You know, I was, wasn't feeding myself properly and, uh, you know, all just not a, not a fantastic life. Um, but I, I wanted to see this business succeed. And for me, it was really the fear of regret. I, I could deal with the business not working and me having to go back and get a job. I couldn't deal with me getting a job and then not knowing what happened with that business. Like, what if I just stayed there? What if I tried that? What if I said yes? What if I, I didn't want to live with an entire lifetime of regret. And so I used the fear of regret to motivate me to go and do the thing that I was afraid of doing because I didn't know if it would, I, nobody in my family was an entrepreneur. I wasn't really an entrepreneur. I had no business background. I had no education. You know, all of the things were, you know, against me on paper, but uh, I just made the, f the, the future fear bigger than the current fear. And that motivated me to go off and try it. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of. Like what I did in my first business, 
stood on the other side of that fear. My, my fear to get going, my fear to say no to that big job, my fear of, you know, my friends judging me for failing. I succeeded. And that is one of the highlights, right? Any major thing that you're going to do in your life, the things that you will be the most proud of and want to tell your grandkids about is going to come after you conquer some fear. Rule number four is find your tribe. If you want to do amazing things in your life, who do you tell that to? Yeah. And like probably nobody, like maybe your spouse and hopefully they're supportive. <laughs> uh, but a lot of us don't have anybody. And so when you can, whether you create your own group uh, or find the group that's actually your people, yeah. it's so amazing. It's great. Uh, and so I've been fortunate to be in a bunch of rooms and also I, I like being able to bring people together uh, in our program. So it's, it's, not so much about me, although I hopefully have something to share when I'm leading things, yeah. but also like, I want you to meet, I want Sarah to meet John yeah. and like, they're going to, and people start businesses together and stay in touch together. Like you talk about the mastermind. Um, yeah. I do this four time a year mastermind group for thought leaders. You have to be a thought leader creating content. Um, and for the women in the group, all share the same house. So like they get an Airbnb and they're all from different countries. Yeah. Uh, Norway, Canada, United States, and, and another United States in a different state. And every every time they're booking, they share an Airbnb. And the four of them take over this house. It's like they created amazing friendship. It's not even just about a business relationship, but they do shows together and, and you know, help each other out. But like they formed friendships where it's really hard to make friends as an adult. You know, like how do you make new friends? We don't really a lot you know once you're out of school how do you make new friends um and so i love being able to bring people together and you know we have a message that, and, and some education we'll share but the best part for me is learning how they've connected with each other as opposed to just learning what i had to teach also to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video i've designed a special free worksheet just for this video the worksheet will highlight our favorite lessons from the video that will inspire you to remember what you learned today and actually apply them the worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five is develop self-discipline. I feel like discipline's key to, you know, keep things going, growing, and obviously that momentum. Yeah, I mean, for discipline, I, I, the the easiest thing for me is just to have a calendar. And I think successful people, or at least the ones I know, have a calendar and a routine. So nobody I know wakes up and says, "It's going to be an amazing day. I'm going to change the world." Let's go, right? Like that's what we think. Of. You don't we, do that. No, I don't do that. I don't do that, Joe. You don't either, right? I mean, it's like we, we see these people on YouTube and Instagram and just think, man, they just wake up and it's always rainbows and it's, everything is just amazing. yeah. And, they're the greatest entrepreneur and the greatest father and like in the greatest. And they don't work. And, right? <laughs> and they never work. And it's just, right. That's what we think. Right. But, but the difference is uh. just the habits and routines. Right. So what do you do when you wake, I wake up and I, I might be tired. I might've had a rough night. I, I still get up and I go do the thing that I'm supposed to be doing. And so whenever I want to, I think, I think um, there are moments where you have to, you have to bring in the discipline because you're tired or there's something else. So there's a shiny object over here that you want to go off and do. But I think if you're always, if you're always relying on willpower, you're eventually going to fail where the yeah. calendar is a thing that ends up saving you. Right. So I'm here right now with you because it's in my calendar. If it wasn't in my calendar, well, like, same here. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we both would have forgot about it. <laughs> or, be, or beyond there's some other thing that's popping up. Right. And so we tend to schedule in things with other people, but we don't, tend to schedule or at least people who are first learning this don't schedule things in for themselves like time for you to work time for you to write your book time for you to be creative time for you to brainstorm the next five years of your business time with your wife and with your kids time for yourself to do your whatever your meditation your yoga your sauna your cold plunge like we'll often just abandon all those things and focus only on business stuff that rely yeah. with other people um but if you can then create a calendar that fits your whole life, that's that's the unlock for me. I get a great idea 
I talk to you, I get inspired. If it's a habit that I need to keep doing, you're going to tell me about some new infrared, something I need to go off and do. Great. Uh, it's a great idea. Ooh, exciting. If it's not on my yeah. calendar, like it's never going to happen. It's not happening. Yeah, it's not, it's happening. not happening. Rule number six is know your purpose. Why is this idea of finding your purpose, whatever you want to call it, like, why is that so important for someone who's trying to develop the reputation? I think it's just important in general, not just to uh, establish your reputation. I think the Fair. reputation becomes a byproduct of you living a life that you love. So I think most people wake up, feel like they know they're capable of more. They know they want to contribute. Serving others, helping others hits the same part in your brain as having food and having sex, which are important. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> so it's hardwired into you. You like helping other people, but there's also there's different levels. So, you know, holding the door for somebody is great. It'll make you feel a little bit happy or buying a coffee for the person behind you in line. But when you can see somebody who is a younger version of you in terms of maybe not age, but they're going through something that you went through and you know that you can be the spark or be a source of hope or inspiration or belief for them and help them get out of their hole, that will fill you up in a way that holding the door for somebody won't. And so it's important as a human to realize that you're capable of great things and you're capable of having a giant impact on people. Either the world, you want to serve you know, the planet or you want to serve the 25 closest people to you. But if you're not happy, it's because you're not serving. And then out of the byproduct of serving others and knowing how you're meant to serve, then that becomes your reputation, right? So I believe in people. I think everybody has Michael Jordan level talent at something. And so I, that's what I want people to find in themselves. And I want to be a bit of a catalyst to help that on every show I do, every video I make, every Instagram post I put up. I'm trying to find different ways and different angles to help people believe more in themselves because I think it's the world's biggest problem. I think the right. world's biggest problem is people don't believe in themselves enough. So as a result of finding that now has become my reputation or my brand. Rule number seven is find your core value. I think everybody, if you're a human being, you have core values. You have something that you really very, makes you different than somebody else, right? Like what you find most important to the world is going to be different than other people. And I think when you understand what is really important and meaningful to you, then you can go and build a life that you want and build a business for the entrepreneurs out there too. So if, if you're, you know, if you're about imagination, as an example, you know, I, I see the creative art behind you, the, the anime and your, 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 fun intro that uh, I haven't seen before on YouTube channels, right? Like if you go all in on imagination as an example, then it just allows you to be more free. It reduces the chains that, you know, people may put on you to say, well, Johnny, we expect you to be like this. And it's like, well, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I, I have, I know what I'm about. And a lot of people, they don't know what they're about. And so when they say, Johnny, you need to go do this, you're like, oh, okay, I guess I need to go do that because my parents think I should, or because my school teacher thinks I should, or because my culture thinks I should, or whatever it is. And so you end up making all these decisions in your life based on what other people want for you, instead of actually just knowing what you want for yourself. I don't think enough people know what they want for themselves. And so they don't go off and do anything about it. Uh, and so that's what the book tries to uncover, figure out the one thing that you stand for, so that you can go off and live a life that is with meaning, with purpose. And for the people who want to become entrepreneurs as well, there's a guideline on how to apply your one word to your business. Rule number eight is overcome self-doubt. If there's no doubt, you're saying like beyond the shadow of it, if there's no doubt, then it's too small. Mm. I mean, if you knew 100% that you could do it, you're not dreaming big enough. Mm. There's, there's lots of things that you can do with no doubt. You could tie your shoelace with yeah. no doubt. But who cares? I mean, that used to be a big thing. It did. When you were, how, I don't know, what age, five years <laughs> yeah. old? When do you learn the tie shoe list? You're like, you're like, I don't know if I can do this. I can't do this. I don't know how to do it. And then all of a sudden you did it. And now uh, now it's nothing. It's easy. Um, and that will always be there just for bigger things. Mm. You know, like you look at, when when did you say you went to Brendan's thing? Was it five years mm, ago? I think my first time was 2017. Mm -hmm. Okay. So seven years ago. Um you go back to Sarah 10 years ago mm -hmm. compared to Sarah now. Yeah. It's like, it's not possible. I, I, I would say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what are you doing? Like, that's crazy. Yeah. There's no way mm -hmm. you're doing all this stuff. You're, you have a podcast. Mm -hmm. What? You can't do that. So you're already an impossibility to yourself, let alone other people. You, you have created an impossible life to yourself. Yeah. To younger mm -hmm. you. Right. Like if, if, you from 10 years ago looked at you right now. It's like, that's not possible. Like, here's your future. No, that's not going to happen. That's not me. I can't do that. 
<laughs> right? And it's actually happened. So like so the same thing, like you're going going forward, you're gonna continue to create more impossibilities for yourself. And the fact that there is doubt means that you're on the right path. It doesn't mean that you uh, succumb to it. Yeah. Uh, especially consistently. Everybody's gonna have bad days, bad moments. But the fact that there is doubt means you're on the right path mm. and you're thinking big mm. and creating a new impossibility for yourself. Yeah. Um, so that's one. It's like, don't, that, w- it's normal. You're human. Rule number nine is balance your life. So everybody's going to have a different version of balance. How much yeah. time you want to spend, like what makes a good father? You know, Brandon has his version and Michael Jordan has his version and I have my version. And we tend to compare ourselves against other people, which can be really detrimental because we usually kick ourselves down instead of forward. So the key is then thinking, well, what does my version of balance look like? for me. And so how much time you want to spend with your kids? How much time you want to spend with your wife? How much time you want to spend in your business? How much time you want to spend volunteering? Whatever is important to you, working out, there's no right answer, but there's a right answer for you. And so the purpose should be baked into everything. The purpose is not just a, here's what I'm going to do in my business and I'm going to shut it off when I go home. And rule number 10, the last one before some very social bonus clips is follow your passion. What advice that you can give to um, a, a young and inspiring entrepreneur to be able to navigate of building a business and becoming successful at it? I think the most important thing is that you have to do the thing that you're excited by. I think uh, just to the last point, you got to do the thing that you love. The most important thing, if I, if I look at all the, all the people that I've covered and all the famous entrepreneurs we profiled, follow your passion, love what you do is the consistently the most common thing that pops up. And so you have to find the thing that you love, even if you don't know how you're going to make money at it yet. A lot of people start the other way. They look for a way to make money and then they do something that they don't love. And you can make a little bit of money, but you're never going to, you're never, never going to have a big impact. You're never going to do anything really solid. Um, so you have to love what you do. Tell me about your daily routine. So I have a morning routine and an evening routine that are fairly consistent. And then I have a daily routine that's different than other days. So, so one day a week to do different things. In terms of that kind of daily routine that switches up, um, switching costs are real, you know, even even in monotasking, like we know multitasking of, of trying to do multiple things at once, but even monotasking to do one thing at a time, switching costs are huge between jumping from one thing to another. So if I'm gonna jump from you to then go and write my book, to then going and doing email to then go it's just it's too much of a switch you know for me to get into the zone of writing my book i need 45 minutes just to get back to where i was from the last time i left off from it so i try to assign different things for different days now i'm i'm in complete control pretty much of my calendar that may not be the case for everybody but for what you can control then being intentional about it so for me monday monday is my mentoring day we have 40 people on my team I want to be the kind of boss that when they come in, we make them a better human than if they ever leave, right? So I spend the whole day mentoring the people on my team. Tuesday is my YouTube day. It's content day. I'm filming. Like if you do not have time on your calendar to film, you're not going to film. You're not going to make the content. If you wait till you're inspired, you're never going to make anything. So <laughs> Tuesday good. is like YouTube. It's consistent. It's in my calendar. Every Tuesday, I'm making content. Wednesday is my project day and that is free. It's open. It's whatever I want to work on because the overscheduled entrepreneur usually ends up hating their life or their business because they never have time to work on the things that that is new into their company. So my Tuesdays and Thursdays are really jam packed. Wednesday in the middle is completely open. So yesterday was a Wednesday. I'm working on my book. Next Wednesday, I might work on something completely different. And it doesn't always have to have a practical payoff. It's just right. something new, fun, experience. Creativity is messy. So Wednesday is a messy day. Thursday is my public facing day. Interviews, podcast. Today's a Thursday when we're recording this, right? That's right. So when we book these, you know, I have 25 minutes on, five minute break, 25 minutes on, five minute break. So after this, I'm going into another 25 minute session, then a five minute break. And it's like my whole day gets filled up doing other people's shows and podcasts. And it's it, it's just staying in the same energy. Like the energy you're getting now, I'm naturally introverted and shy. People don't get that about me. It doesn't come across, but the energy I'm showing up for your show is the result of the five other shows I've done before getting to you. Right. And I'm going to then take a sheesh energy and pour it into the next person. Yeah, right. Yeah. So this, you're, you're not um, sucking my energy. You're feeding me energy that I'm then going to pour into the person who comes afterwards. Right. So like staying in that energy zone is really important. That's how the day flies by and you get into flow instead of having to jump from one thing to the next. Friday is my CEO day. 
Um, and I started with CEO hour. It's like, if I had one hour, what would I do? If I was a CEO, like whatever that means to you, you're the CEO of your business now, what does that person do? And I moved it to be the whole day. So like working on the business instead of in the business. Uh, and then apply it to the weekend, like Saturday's fun day. Saturday is fun stuff to do with my wife, with the family. Not like we just got a new house and there's insane amounts of work that has to get done. Sure. But that's not Saturday. So, that Saturday is what we're going to do for fun. New restaurant, street festival, drive-in movie theater, hang out, like whatever, but fun. And then Sunday's family admin day where that's the... Getting ready for school and, and the, yeah, exactly. going to Costco and doing the laundry and whatever. And then, and then repeats again on Monday. And like that, your, you know, your actions have to map to your ambitions. You have, you have goals of what you want to accomplish and not just like business goals, but a life. What do you, what do you want to, what does your dream life look like? And then you have to have it in your calendar to do the actions. Otherwise it just becomes, you know, a, a hope. So that's my, yeah, that's my, I love um, it. It's my life design, routine. man. It's all life about design. life design. And, and it'll change and switch, right? Yeah, like when it changes. I, at the beginning, I had nobody on my team. So I didn't have a, a, a mentoring day. Who was I mentoring? Nobody. So let's get to work. Now I have 40 people on my team. So I need to have a day focused on mentoring. And so the willingness, this is like the willingness to pivot and change, especially in entrepreneurship, because you learn and grow, right? Like entrepreneurship is the greatest personal development course of all time. You're That's learning right. and growing and improving. So it's crazy to think that how you start and what you're working on now is still gonna be the same thing in three years. Like your business has to pivot and change and your calendar has to pivot and change as you change and evolve as a human being. So wherever I'm not happy, especially consistently, like if it's a couple of days in a row of not being happy, something is wrong in my calendar. Like I'm just yeah. not doing the right things anymore and I need to make a change. And if you can catch it early enough, then you don't end up having this giant crisis where you have to make this insane change, right? Because you feel you just fell completely out of alignment with yourself. I think motivation is like short term. So there's gotta be like a long-term solution. I think the key to that is like momentum because like once you start getting wins and like you, you start feeling like that high from winning, like it just kind of, it gets addicting. And it obviously all starts with small wins, like just waking up when you tell yourself you're going to wake up. It gets like, it gets addictive because you start to change your identity for yourself. You yeah. start to see yourself as somebody who's successful, who's having yeah. success. That's the addictive part. It's like I'm, I'm a successful person. Like I am starting to get results. I feel great about myself that I'm getting these results. And so that's why hitting the snooze button is the opposite. You're telling yourself that you suck. Mm -hmm. telling yourself I don't hit my goals so you have to be very careful about the goals you set for yourself and to make sure you follow through and I love momentum and I think you should if you did something every day that made yourself feel proud like I'm proud of myself today yeah like you guys you're proud of yourself for doing whatever and I, and I can't judge what you feel proud of or not but if you're proud of yourself every day for doing something whether you get a result or not just the fact that you tried to do something and you're proud of that that builds your self-respect, that creates momentum, and that changes your life. Walk us through an average every day for you as a high performer. Well, average every day or or when oh, I was on tour doing 90 yeah, tour, days? On tour, on tour, on tour. Yeah. So part of the reason for doing the tour was I was afraid of speaking. And I'd done a lot of speaking, but it was always just like, uh, you, you speak and then it, you're scared and then I come back home and then I'm fine. And then you, I was, I, I wanted to get rid of this fear of speaking. And so I thought, okay, I'm just going to go and do 23 cities and every four days speak again, every three, four days, like a new, new city, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, get my reps in. And that became the starting point. So every fourth day, basically I was in a new city speaking, uh, every fourth day, we also had to travel. We still had to work uh, and I wanted to spend some time with Nina. It was me, Nina and my cameraman, Danny, for 90 days together. <laughs> Hotel wow. hopping, Airbnb hopping. It was it was a pretty chaotic but fun ride. What are your thoughts on the idea that maybe the, the lack of self-belief really is just the problem is exposure for some people? Yeah, and, and we're around people who keep us stuck. Like yeah. your environment has been perfectly designed to keep you where you are. And the fortunate thing and you know going 2023 2024 is you can change it mm -hmm. like you're the opportunities you have right now at your age are so much better than your parents at your age yeah like we have the internet yeah mm -hmm. we have youtube 
all the best mentors and teachers are there. Like the information now is available. The opportunities are available. You had to be crazy. If my, I'm 42 years old. If I look at my dad when he was 42, he would have to be crazy to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You have to be basically unemployable, crazy <laughs> yeah. to, to start your own company. And, and mm -hmm. it was really hard. Now anybody can do it. So the world has changed. And so if you don't like the environment that you're in and the people and the voices that are in your head, cool. You can shift it. You can now choose to be around more positivity. And, and I encourage people to really do an audit of the friends in your life, the people in your life, and also who you're following on Instagram, on YouTube, the, the various platforms. When you watch YouTube videos or you're on Instagram and you put it down, do you feel better about yourself mm -hmm. or worse? Do you spend, spend two hours just kind of mindlessly scrolling? Cool. Like, unfollow all those people. Yeah. Because there's lots of, like Instagram and YouTube are not the problem. There's lots of great people posting amazing content. Your life can change by being around the right people. Yeah. So consciously choose, engineer who you're going to be following and who you're going to listen to. I do the interview and I was so nervous going into it that I, I'm wearing these, you know, a, a thick kind of hoodie mm -hmm. that I was sweating all through like the Tony interview. We're like, oh my God, more in the lead up. But after I'm so hot, like, oh, I can't breathe. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. we did it, but I'm, I'm sweating buckets. And so I take off my shirt to mm -hmm. cool off, but I have five minutes until my next show with somebody else where yeah. I'm being interviewed. And so I get on and I forget to put my hoodie back on. So I'm in my undershirt and this is what I want to train you and other people. The immediate voice in my head is, oh, I need to, oh my God, look at myself. Like we went, we started recording. My camera comes on like, oh my God, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't realize. But then right away, it's like, no, I'm going to do this. As opposed to the guy would have been fine to say, hey, oh my God, I'm sorry. Can I just put my hoodie on? I'm sure he's going to say yes. Right. But yeah. I want to lean into that discomfort. And so I did the whole interview in my undershirt just because. Nice. You know? Mm -hmm. Just because. Now this guy, I mean, hopefully this guy gets a unique interview that's different um, than everybody else. Uh, and so that, that, like, it's constantly trying to lean into those moments, whether it's on camera or not, that I'm afraid to do this. What am I afraid of? I'm afraid of being judged, right? Like, I mean, I could be in my undershirt all day, but I don't want to be on the, in my undershirt in front of yeah. other people, right? Yeah. And so because of that fear, I don't want that fear to own me, so I have to step into it. And now I could do it again if I needed to, right? It's not an expression of me, right? Like, I don't want to walk around all day in my undershirt. It's, it's an undershirt for a reason, but mm -hmm. I could do it if I wanted to, and I don't want that fear to control me. And I think yeah. a lot of people don't, do things because of the fear. They don't post to Instagram because of how it might be judged. Yeah, they don't YouTube. post to YouTube because of how yeah. people might look at them. They don't ask for that interview because they might get a no, right? Yeah. Um, so every time I feel that fear or potential embarrassment, then I want to I want to step in and do it. And worst case, it becomes a great story. How do you get to that level? Because there's so much noise, isn't there? There's so many people competing and people get... This is a bit of a long-winded question, but people get very disheartened because they don't get immediate results. So they say, oh, it doesn't work. So what would you say to those people? Well, I, I don't know if you've seen my journey. I, I post it on my website. So if anybody wants to see how, how uh, slowly I took at the beginning to get going, uh, it, people use it as inspiration. Um, I post every year. So I started uh, in 2009. And every May, I post where, where I'm at in terms of my subscriber growth. And in the first year was 25 subscribers. And the second year is like a hundred subscribers, something. In my fifth year, I still had 700 subscribers or something like that. And that's like people will say, how did you not quit? Like, how do you keep going? How you, you're in year five and you only have 700 something subscribers. Like you might want to go find something else. <laughs> I, mean, I was like, it's not working. Go do something else. Uh, so I, I mean, I just, I love doing it. And mm. I think that's why you have to love the process of the thing that you're doing. And yeah. if anybody, people, you know, I challenge people to do this because it's a fun thing, but a lot of times people will take, take that graphic of how I'm doing year by year. And then they, they uh, put it into an Instagram post or video or a tweet or something to say that they're beating Evan Carmichael because most people are beating me. Most people by year five, you know, already have more than 700 something subscribers. So you can say that you're ahead of me. Yeah. The only difference is I kept going. You okay. know, I just, I just kept going. I kept making it. I kept creating content. I kept sharing. And when people ask, well, how did you keep going? Like, how did you not quit? What gave you the inspiration and reason to keep going? 
I always focus on who I was serving instead of who I wasn't. Okay. And that made a, a huge shift for me because we all, most of us are in the who I'm not serving game, right? Even now I've got three, whatever million subscribers. Why is it not four? Why is it not five? Why is it not 10? You know what the, the who I'm not game is never ending. Yeah. But who you are serving right now can make all the difference in the world. So that those 25 people in my first year, it's like, those are 25 people who subscribe to my channel. You know, like, that's pretty cool. I thought that was pretty cool. If you go and you speak at a, at a library or a YMCA, or my first speaking gig was at a YMCA, and 25 people show up, that's pretty cool. Now, I thought I would think that's pretty cool. My first speaking, I had three people show up. So if 25 people showed up, That'd be pretty cool. And so if you can, if you can re-engineer your mind to, to think about that, that, hey, if I have 25 people or 100 people or 1,000 people or however, however big your audience is, it doesn't mean that you stop growing and you get complacent and you just only live in gratitude for what you've got. But if you focus on serving them instead of who you're not serving, it does a couple things. One, it, it's a lot more fun. You yeah. know, I feel like you matter and that the work you're doing is having an impact on people. And that fun we all want to feel like we're doing something that matters. Since so if you can actually connect the thing that you're, you're doing actually matters to somebody, maybe not the world. You and I want to serve the world. Cool. And if you knew that you did something today that helped at least one person, it's easy to have the motivation to keep going it and doing it again the next day, the next day, the next day. And two, the people who you are serving will take you to the people who you're not serving. You know, like if you keep serving your people, well, they'll tell them, they'll tell their friends about you. Say, Hey, go watch this person's video. Um, and you never know the impact that you're, you're having on people. We talk about James Altucher, something that he had mentioned on Twitter one one day and that really stuck with me was he added up all the minutes uh, and all the minutes which add up to hours that we spend like watching TV and being in traffic and being in the restroom and being on Twitter and on social media and checking emails and texting people. And it, it came out to this ridiculous amount of hours per day. And then I think the question was posed like, you know, imagine what you could be creating instead of doing this, doing these other things. And so to yeah. your point, you were able to, to crank this out in a very short amount of time. Yeah. And, and I, I started on a Tuesday. We had our Instagram live session on a Tuesday. We finished at, you know, three o'clock and the book is called Momentum. So when she asked, when are you going to start? Well, how, how do I start it next year? Like it's called Momentum. I kind of have to start <laughs> like right now. If, if I'm going to call it Momentum, right? Yeah. <laughs> if I was going to call it procrastination, then that's fine. Next year. Great. Uh, so I had to start right away. And I got some words done that day. I got some words done the next day on the Wednesday. Wednesday is my project day, so it's completely open. So I had time to, to work on things. But then the day after that was Thursday. And Thursday is my public facing day where it's wall to wall interviews and podcasts. And like we're recording this on a Thursday. I don't know when it goes live, but it's wall to wall, 25 minutes on, five minute break, 25, like the whole day. It's like, well, I'm not going to get any work done on, on my book on Thursday. Like there's no way. And I write this, like my insecurities and concerns, like I don't want to lose momentum on the book because I'm going to day three and there's zero time to do it. And then on Thursday, two people cancel back to back last minute. So now I have like this hour in the middle of the day to actually do something. And so we think about it, like, what do we normally do if, if something happens? If I couldn't make this podcast for some reason, Freddie, I'm sick, Freddie, what I, I, that happens. People cancel, reschedule, stuff yeah. always happens. What do we do in that time? Do we, do we actually be intentional with it? Probably I would have, I don't know, checked email, checked my social media, something, probably not the highest leverage because I had something else planned. It got last minute changed. So I'm going to do something low value, but like I got an hour. Let me write. This is, this is fantastic. Right. And I think we actually can find these moments where we are wasting time or doing low level activity, um, where we stay busy. I think a, a lot of entrepreneurs stay busy on things that, a lot of times don't matter. Like we do a lot of work that's not very efficient. We're distracted by a bunch of things and the actual outcome of that thing is actually not that consequential versus taking action on the thing that actually means the most to us. So I think we have those moments. And again, I had a full schedule. I got 40 something people on my team. I'm running multiple businesses and agencies and I had no time planned to write this book. On top of that, we had a health scare in the middle of it where my wife got this lump above her breast that we have to go to the doctor and like, was insane. She's mm. okay. Like I talk about that in the book. Uh, but that killed an entire day. I'm behind on everything. And yet still got the book done 40,000 words in five days. Why is there so much 
negativity in the system, well, it's because there's a lot of pain in the system. Uh, when you've been in pain, did you always show up as your best self? Did you show up and do things that you were super proud of when you were hurting in a lot of pain? Mm -hmm. Right? Probably not, right? Like you all, you come out and you do a lot of negative things sometimes. And so just understanding that can, can take a lot of the sting out of people's words. This isn't a bad person. This isn't a toxic person. They're just in a lot of pain. And we expect people who are in pain to, to lash out and do bad things. Um, anyway, once you figure out what that who is, that serves you for life. So if yours is believe, then now you know the kinds of people who you need on your team. If you're going to hire a video editor, it's great if they have all the skill sets of how to cut videos together, but they better love belief. They better, they better be a person who likes belief. It doesn't necessarily have to be their who, but it's got to be pretty close. Mm -hmm. So now you know the kinds of people that you want to attract into your life. You know the message that you want to put out there to the world. It becomes the lens through which you see the world. And any time that you're not happy, it's because there's a lack of belief somewhere, lack of belief in yourself, lack of belief in the relationships around you, lack of belief in the team members that you've got, um, lack of belief in the projects that you've got going on. That leads to unhappiness. And so it's also a quick fix. You just, we just need to have more belief in the system for us to be happy. And that's for anybody. You figure out your who, it gives you that roadmap for happiness for the rest of your life. It, it doesn't get old. Like that Tina will be 120 years old, still believing in other people. It's not going to be like, oh, this year I'm going to switch it to something else. Like, no, that's who you are. What advice would you give to folks who are listening to this, who know that they're destined for more? And what message would you like to leave them with today? Just to know that it's possible, that whatever that dream in your head is, that it's actually probably even small compared to what you're capable of, and that it's possible, and that people with less intelligence and less resources than you, your heroes, a lot of them start with less than what you have right now. You have Steven to pay attention to. You know, a lot of your heroes didn't have anybody, and they figured it out. And so if they can, you can too. And it requires a different way of thinking. It requires uh, a different way of acting. It requires you maybe saying no to some people and then saying yes to new people and new opportunities in your life. But your dream is possible. And you just have to wake up every day and take one more step towards making momentum happen towards it. Because I think for a lot of people, the biggest thing they're missing is just momentum. Did you have that experience that you had to go clean up your network or your circle of friends or... Yeah, I mean, one, I'm introverted, so I don't have a lot of friends. So that 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 uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of friends <laughs> was, was a big deal at the beginning. But I think it it for me it wasn't like there was this one person or group of people who were really negative around me. It was more just a slow letting go and spending less time with people that then it kind of fades out. So it wasn't an intentional. You're a negative person, and I'm not going to talk to you anymore. It was just I'm. I'm moving in this direction and you're moving in that direction yeah. and we just don't have as much in common anymore. And so we just stopped talking and stopped hanging out. But it was never like this awkward conversation of saying, yeah, yeah. you're out of my life. And uh, I think a lot of people stay in relationships just out of convenience and out of fear. That just because you went to grade four with them, it doesn't mean you still have to be friends with them in your adult life. You're probably, if you're watching the show, right, audience, you're, they're probably way ahead of, ahead of their friends already. They're the most ambitious people that they know. And if somebody is sucking energy from you, you probably don't want to spend as much time with them. And if it's family, it's a little harder. You don't want to necessarily just cut off your mom from your life. Although some people do that because it's the best thing for them. But it could also be limiting access to topics. It's like, okay, we're not talking about my career, because every time we talk about my career, it goes down this crazy negative path. So we're not talking about that, but we're going to talk about these things that we know we can connect on because I love you, right? And so limiting access, working with enough people, I think can be really helpful, but it's just paying attention to the energy that you get from people, right? I'm, you know, I met you earlier this morning. Yep. I'm, I'm coming out of this, right? We're going to have this interview. I already have more energy than when I start. Right? Like we're gonna leave this, and for me at least, I'm gonna have more energy than when we started. Right? And so when you're around the right people, it 
raises your energy. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. And if I if you're if I left an interview with somebody and like I feel worse than I did going in, like okay, I'm not, not going to talk to that person again. Yeah, right. Been there. Yeah. And so there's a lot of energy suckers or energy vampires or it's just paying attention to that consistently. And if you find the awkward part is if you find good people who you really like, try to spend more time with them. And so I have a saying that I like to collect good people. So when somebody asks me, "What do you collect?" I, say, I, good, I collect good, good people. Habit, right? I don't collect, I don't collect baseball cards or stamps. Or I collect good people, and it can be awkward, especially for introverts, at the beginning. It's like when you find somebody at an event, or on a call, or somebody who you don't really know very well, but you just had great energy that you leave and you're like, "Man, that was awesome." I I try to find a way to spend more time with that person, whether it's just message them on Instagram with the star, whether it's trying to set up a coffee meeting to talk about our businesses, like you be the one to reach out because everybody knows somebody in their network who is a positive, optimistic, energy giving person. You may not have a lot of those people, but there's one person you could think of and it's probably not the closest person to you. It's probably a friend of a friend or somebody you met at some event, but you can think of them. Find a way to stay connected with them. Meet them once a month for coffee. Connect with them on Instagram and, and go back and forth. Just like have more of them in your life and watch your life start to ripple forward in a positive direction. What questions do you tend to ask yourself every day? Or if there's just one question, what do you ask yourself? Um, I think the most important one is what's my intention for the day? So the, the first okay. thing that I do is... I wake up and ask, what's, what's my intention for today? What is today? You know, so, so we're recording this on a Thursday. Thursday is my public facing day. Yeah. That's when I, I put my extrovert hat on and I'm doing yeah. interviews and group meetings. And we had our movement makers this morning. Yeah, that's great. And then I had a podcast. Now I'm on your show. And then I'm going to have to do, like, it's just all day long. It's going to be interviews and podcasts and shows. Mm-hmm. And Yesterday was my project day and I just have the whole day open, do whatever I want. And Tuesday is my YouTube day and tomorrow is my CEO day. And when I'm in it, I'm not thinking about what's next. Like today, all I care about is your show and what I'm doing right now. Mm-hmm. And then my next interview, I'm going to think about their show. I, what am I doing tomorrow? I don't know. I mean, I know it's CEO day, but I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing yeah. tomorrow until I get to tomorrow. So mm-hmm. I use the morning as a reset to say, oh, what am I, what am I doing today? Oh, today's Thursday. Okay, Thursday. I, I wake up like... I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like, I wake up like, what day is today? What, what am I supposed to be working on? It's not like I wake up and say, I'm ready. It's Thursday. Let's go fam. Come on. Right. <laughs> like I, nobody wakes up like that. And so I wake up and I'm, uh, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. And I look at the calendar and, and I look at what I'm doing for the day. So who am I, inter- who am I having on? Oh, I'm going to be on a financial developer. Oh yeah. I love that guy. He was on my YouTube live stream. Uh, oh, today's Movement Makers Day. Awesome. Oh, and I'm doing this stuff coming up. Great. And I just want to get myself ready. What's my intention for today? I want to try to bring the best for all the people that I'm trying to show up for. Mm-hmm. My intention is to try to be my best for you here today, for every other you know interview yeah. I'm doing, for Movement Makers this morning. It's my intention. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I don't hit it. You know, maybe maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe you walk away and say, Evan, man, that sucked. That was the worst interview I've ever seen you do. Awesome. It's like, it was still my intention to show up, right? Because yeah. when you're thinking about something else, if I'm here talking to you and I'm thinking about what I'm doing this weekend, I'm not, yeah, it's not, the I'm not here for you. I'm not creating, yeah. I, I think it's disingenuous to the intention here. Yeah. So in the morning, what's my intention for the day? And I'll look at my calendar and I think your calendar should be a reflection of your goals. Okay. Right, like if you want to accomplish your goals, yeah. there's Make habits that have yes. to happen. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just an idea. If you don't do anything, right? If you just, I have mm-hmm. all these ideas of who I want to interview. If you're never reaching out, it's never going to happen. So, in your calendar, sure. has to be actions yeah. that will help you accomplish your goals. On your mission that you're on, what challenges with that format that you've built uh, have you faced for what's next? And what's been the advantage of that format for what you've been able to build and the impact that you're making in the world? My biggest limitation is still lack of belief. Mm. So people say, well, you're the believe guy. It's like, yeah, but I believe in myself to do the things that I've done now, but to do the next, the mm-hmm. next big thing, I don't believe in myself to do the next big. So I still need the channel for myself because I want 
to wake up and have Oprah Winfrey or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or whoever it is whispering messages in my ear to get me going to do the next thing. Um, one of my, my uh, you talk about the format of, of giving tribute to other people. Uh, at the beginning, it was just, hey, I've learned this from these people and I think you might be able to learn too. I was just hoping to shortcut the path because my, my worst day in my first business was when I said I quit on my business partner. And I woke up the next day and said, I can't quit yet because I'm going to regret this if I don't figure this out. At least, at least if it doesn't work out, fine, but at least know that I gave it everything because I don't want to look back and say, ah, I wish I just tried a little bit harder. But I couldn't keep going the way that I was going, so I had to find another path. And the thing that came to me was, I can't be the first person to try to solve this problem. Like somebody's figured this out. Uh, why don't I just model mm-hmm. success? Like that wasn't model success wasn't words that I would use. You know, it was probably a mm-hmm. lot more clumsy. But <laughs> I can't be the first person to figure this out. Somebody's done it, and that's where I studied Bill Gates. It's like Bill Gates had a like who's got a software company? I had a software company. So who's got a successful software company? Bill Gates came to mind. Like I, this was not very uh, advanced planning. It's just. Top of dome. Uh, so, okay, how did Microsoft get started? And how did he build? Like, not so much, how, did, how does Bill Gates make an extra million dollars now? Who cares? But like zero to one, how do you do that? Mm-hmm. And it was through partnerships. And, and learning how he applied that in Microsoft, I brought that to my business and quickly after had my first check for $13,500. And that may not seem like a lot, but when you're making 300 bucks a month, like 13 and a half K, it's like, holy cow, this is a... <laughs> grand slam here and more importantly i could do that again that was just one deal i could close more deals so the idea the strategy there was model success find people who have done this and put that to use in your business or your life and so i i then went on this mission to continue learning how i can model other people's success and then i that eventually became a youtube channel where i shared a lot of messages um a surprising benefit of that has been i've gotten to meet some of these people you know, like I was just profiling some of them and then mm-hmm. now I get to do interviews with them or go hang out with them or go to their houses and some of them have become friends, which was never part of the idea of what I could do. It's just, hey, I love your message. I- I'm trying to get it out to the world because if I learn from it, maybe other people like me can learn from it. And it's been amazing to be able to foster all those connections too. If you're just focused on creating value or doing service, you never know what's going to come back in return. Right? I, I honestly have a hard time connecting. So this is maybe my internal struggle. Sheesh, I mean, you can help me with this. So, <laughs> you know, we've, we've, I, want to, I want to change the world, right? Solve the world's biggest problem. I want to hit every human. I know I'm not going to, but it, it, it changes how I show up to the work that I want to do things that have the ability to scale. So, you know, we've had over 500 million people watch our videos. I don't even know what, I, I, I can't compute that. 500 million people, what does that even mean? That's like right. Like three and a half million subscribers is bigger than my city. I don't, I don't know what that, I can't, I can't process that. I don't know what that means. But coming on and doing a show with you grounds me to feel like, oh, Ashish likes my stuff. You know, Ashish hasn't been inspired by some of my content. You telling me that, that what I've done has had an impact on you is more meaningful in my heart yes. than having three and a half million subscribers on my YouTube channel because I don't know how to connect that. So I, I like to have that balance in that I'm still going for the growth because I want to change the world, but I get the most meaningful connection from talking to an individual entrepreneur who loves the content and had a story to share. How do you personally set goals? And then what happens if you don't hit a goal? Because like it does happen sometimes and like obviously what matters is what you do about it. So so here's the thing. So I don't, most of my goals are habits. They're not like I want to make X amount of money by the end of the year. It's the habits, right? Like so that. it's not I want to be able to lift X amount. It's I want to, I want to be spending half an hour in the gym every day, or I want to make sure I'm waking up at this time every day. It's the habits you can check off and say, I did that. So I think that's where most people will mess up on their goals. It's, it's the daily habits. You are what you consistently do. It's not about achieving that outcome. It's about being the person who can achieve that outcome. And that's by setting daily and weekly consistent habits for yourself. If you don't hit it for some reason, then the big question is, are you proud of the reason why? So I had a guy, I'm doing this tour right now. I'm driving in the car between Sacramento and, and Salt Lake City. 
somewhere in Nevada right now. <laughs> Desert. It's wild. Um, I had a guy in my Columbus stop, and he said, hey, Evan, I, I had a goal that I want to I want to do six days a week cold showers. Okay. One day off, Saturday off, six days a week, cold showers. It was Friday night, my workshop. He said, my heat's been out all day. I've been at my girlfriend's house all day. Her heat was off. And so I've been freezing all day long. And so I, I didn't do my cold shower like I said I would. Should I do my cold shower? I said, well, are you proud of the reason why you didn't do it? And he said, no. Okay, then you have to go take a cold shower. Mm-hmm. And then tomorrow you have to take another cold shower, even though it's your day off, just to show yourself what you're capable of. Damn. And so when you don't do something, it's are you proud of the reason why not? Right? So like I'm on this tour right now, 90 days, 23 cities. I'm, I'm two thirds of the way through as we're talking. I've committed to going to the cities. I've sold tickets in these different cities. You know, if my mom went to the hospital tomorrow for something, I would cancel my tour and go home and be with my mom. I didn't follow through on my goals. I didn't do what I said I was going to do. I'm disappointing a whole bunch of people who who bought tickets. and I do my best to make it up to them, but I'm not going to make everybody happy. Like some people will be pissed at me. Yep. But am I proud of the reason why I didn't do my goal? Hell yeah. So I'm okay yeah. with it. Right? So when you set a goal, you have to follow through. And if you don't, then then are you proud of the reason why not? And if you're not, then you have to come back twice as strong the next day just to show yourself. In what way did you get better? And what did you invest in? So you- it was it was mindset and skill set. So in the mindset, I, I'm introverted, I'm shy. That doesn't come across on like interviews like this, but um, I don't like the spotlight. I don't like being, in, I don't like being on stage. Um, it makes me nervous. I, it's not, it's not enjoyable. I just came back from a three day event in Vegas where I was speaking with, with Gary V and um, Patrick B. David and other great speakers on stage. And I don't like being on stage. I like the, effect it creates on the hallway afterwards to go help people. So I'll, sure. I'm the only speaker who sticks around and then I stay for hours in the hallway talking to people um, because they'll come up to me and ask me questions based off of my talk where normally I, w- I wouldn't go up to anybody and talk to them, not because I'm, I'm too good for them, but because I'm afraid, you know, I'm introverted and shy, um, but we still want to serve. And so that was, that was a huge breakthrough for me when I realized even though I'm introverted and shy, I still want to serve. I still want to yeah. help. And all my models at the time, if you look at who's on TV, you just see the people who are big mouth and extroverted and the life of the party. And like, that wasn't me. So I thought, oh, like to do that, you know, I'm at the same agency as Mel Robbins and Grant Cardone. And both of them are very outwards focused and like the life of the party and extrovert and love talking to people. Um, And just that wasn't me. So I, I, it took a while for me. It, once I tied it to service, then it was an unlock. It's like, it's not about me. It's about the people you can help. Mm-hmm. And then that became like, oh, okay. But how does an introvert make a lot of YouTube videos and win? I don't know, but we'll just figure it out. You know, like, let's, let's try. Let's see what happens. Um, and then the second part of that was was getting help and communication and getting help. Once I decided to take it more seriously, mm-hmm. that I realized, oh, I should be doing more than then um yeah just getting coaching getting help and watch my videos back and becoming a better speaker um so people can get there a lot faster it's not like oh once you have a thousand subscribers or a hundred thousand subscribers or a million subscribers or whatever it is then instantly everything gets better it's much Mm -hmm. more about are you are you good enough or do you have the skill set and the talent and the mindset to actually make great content and Mm -hmm. obviously the more repetition you put in the better but but getting yeah. coaching and getting help and getting people to give you guidance um, really helped me too. I think if we look at Instagram, for example, it's a lot of people sharing all of their best moments. It's their highlight reel of their life and all these awards that you won and the beautiful Photoshop beach picture and all that. And I think there's still definitely a lot of that and a lot of people who are too afraid to ever show any kind of weakness. Um, even some people in the personal development space are like too afraid to show their weakness. Uh, and then some people are very candid and upfront and share everything. And that becomes their brand. Um, you know, if you look at Gary, he's, he's very open about how he struggles with candid, uh, being candid, having candid conversations. Um, Mel Robbins is very open to sharing 
like her brand of personal development is basically all the stuff that she's trying to figure out for herself. Yeah. She says, and then she, she learns and then she teaches. Uh, so I think, you know, authenticity is a big buzzword people are throwing around. I think it can definitely help connect people to you. I think it just depends on who you're following. Um, there's a lot of people who, who come off as perfect still and they, they grow their following doing that. And there's a lot of people who lean into the other side and show all the, the warts and, um, that attracts people as well. <laughs> I love that. Showing all the warts. <laughs> Showing all the warts. And, and you get to decide who you want to be, right? I think ultimately yeah. you'll be happier if you show the warts and the, what you're insecure about. And like James Altucher, a friend of the channel, um, he likes to say for his podcast that he basically thinks about what's the, what's the problem that he's most embarrassed about right now that like someone like him should have figured out. Mm hmm. And then tell people about it. <laughs> like, what are you struggling with right now that you should have already figured out by now? And then, yeah. and then tell people. Yeah. Uh, and, and that makes him very endearing. That's why a lot of people love him. Do you believe we're born to do something or do we just find something along the way? I think everybody has what I call Michael Jordan level talent at something. Most people never find it. Uh, I believe even the, the greatest basketball player of all time isn't Michael Jordan. It's somebody you've never heard of. It's a manager at Starbucks because he never picked up a basketball. And so he could have been the greatest of all time. And instead, he's a manager at Starbucks and he's OK with his life instead of being great at something. And so I don't know, you know, I don't I don't know about the words destined or anything like that. But I, I believe everybody has that kind of talent. You have genius level talent at something. And you've got to go and figure out what that is. And it's it's your responsibility, not just to yourself, but to your community, to your family, to the people around you, to the world, to then share it, share that gift. And so part of the path to finding it is just trying things. You know, maybe not everybody should be an entrepreneur, but everybody should try it. You should try it and see, like, did I like that? Did I, was that fun? Was that enjoyable? Do I want to keep doing that? And if it's not, great, then go do something else. I think too many people don't try enough things. We get locked into a career path way too soon and then you don't know how to get off of it. And then the further on you get, the more responsibilities you have, the more difficult it is to jump off and do your own thing. And so I think it's everybody's responsibility first to themselves to have a happy life, to figure out what they have Michael Jordan level talent at. I encourage entrepreneurs to go through um, a three-step process, which is eliminate, automate, delegate. Okay. So you look at the work that you're doing and Maybe you shouldn't be doing it at all. Like before you give it to somebody else, maybe it sh just shouldn't get done. And there's, hmm. there's often things that we're doing that we think are really high value that then turn out to like to not matter. And we may not even notice it, right? I mean, before Mover Makers, I had a mastermind that I ran in Toronto for entrepreneurs. And when people joined, um, we took uh, minutes, like notes of what was happening. Like I took minutes. This is before AI could do yeah. it for you and transcripts. Like, I wrote down minutes for what everybody said and, and homework and assignments and everything. And um, there was one month where I forget what happened. Like I was going away the next day or something and I didn't get the notes out to people after the meeting. Nobody cared. <laughs> like no response, no message, no like, hey, where's the minutes? Where's the notes? And I and so I didn't do it again next month. Nobody cared. It's like, wow, wow I've been spending all this time on something that like nobody cared about that I thought was high value, but was actually zero value for people. Um, maybe it was even negative value. Maybe I was annoying them with it. I don't know. Uh, and so eliminate first, you know? So, I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs might be frustrated with their accounting and bookkeeping. Uh, you cannot eliminate that, right? Like that has to get done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you will run into problems if you try to eliminate that from your business, right? <laughs> And I was going to go into that for you, but yeah, keep going. Yeah, the government will come for you. That is a big problem. Uh, unless you live in some country that, that doesn't move to the moon or something. But yeah. Um, yeah, you know, that's a problem. So you can't eliminate that. But but there's a lot of things that we're doing that just should not be done. It just be completely eliminated. The next is automate. So before giving it to a human, give it to technology. So use software, use tools, use AI, use QuickBooks, use like there's a lot of things. There's software and tools for a lot of things that you should should start applying into your business uh, that can save a lot of man hours. Um, and then you get to delegate. So eliminate, automate, and then delegate. And so these are the things that still have to get done, but 
should not be done by you. So in eliminate, they shouldn't be done at all. In automate, they need to be done, but should be done by a human. And then in delegate, it's it, sh it should be done, but shouldn't be done by you. It has to be done by another human. And that's where you start to scale and build and create. Evan, I find you so interesting because you're an introvert. And, 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 and generally speaking, introverts get energy for being alone. That's kind of like part of it. Um, also, call me out if that's wrong. But what's interesting is you get a lot of energy from helping people which usually in context is around people. Yeah. So it's just an interesting thing with you where it's like, you keep saying you're an introvert, but then when we were meeting, you were like pretty chill and laid back. And then the second that we started talking about you, like it's like you were taking the energy yeah. from the environment. So it was just, it's interesting. I, I don't know that I'll speak on behalf of all introverts, but yeah. you know, my own story would be, I struggled with this a lot. My biggest fight with my agent was like, you need to be famous, Evan. It's like, I, I don't want to be famous. <laughs> yeah. Why do I want to be famous? I don't want to be famous. And he's like, I don't understand you. Everybody I work with wants to be famous. It's like, okay, cool. I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to be famous. And so we fought for years until he said, you don't understand, you know, the, the, if you get more famous, people will hear the message. Mm -hmm. And it's always been about the message. And so hanging out in most, like, I remember being in San Diego. Uh, it, this still happens. This is like late last year, a couple months ago in San Diego, uh, Grant Cardone was doing this event on in San Diego and it was on a boat and the boat was going to have like Tim Tebow and like all these mm -hmm. celebs and and you went on a boat cruise and you come back and because it was like three or four hours on the boat and I'd have no way to get back if I didn't like it mm -hmm. I didn't go <laughs> 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 right it's like yeah. oh three hours on a yeah. boat and I have no way to get back what if yeah. I hate it right it's, it's like, terrible like, yeah, yeah. I, I need an escape plan I, I, I gotta go um but what I realized was introverts love to serve. Yeah. Like we want to serve too. We want to feel like the work we do has meaning and matters to people. And so that's what I lean in and focus on. Mm -hmm. And most conversations do drain me. Yeah. If you want to talk about the weather or I don't know, what do people talk about? I, I don't know what people talk about. Yeah. I suck at all that stuff. I hate it. It drains me. Like I really, I, I do not like networking events. It drains me to no end. I hate introducing myself. I hate asking, answering like, well, what do you do? All of that. Like I never talk to the person on the airplane next to me. Yeah. All of it, zero. Uh, but if you can hit on like a couple of, if you're an entrepreneur or you love salsa dancing or League of Legends, uh, we could probably have like a really deep five-hour conversation. And so I think, at least for me, it may not be for all introverts, we love meaningful, deep Mm. powerful conversations and none of the surface fluffy stuff. And that's the stuff that um, really will drain me and I'll avoid yeah, as much as possible. Yeah. How do you uh, make your team better? Like, how do you like to go ahead and try and make, improve your team day to day? Yeah, I think it's, it's caring about them as people, mm. wanting them to win as humans more than you want them to win with you. I want the people on my team to win as people more than I want them to win with me. Now, quite often, it's a similar path. It's like, hey, you want to do this. Your best path is to stay with me and I'll help you get there. But it may mean that they have to leave and go do something else, right? Yeah. Like Zan, if you watch our, our live stream, Zan is my co-host. Yeah. Um, I want Zan to win mm -hmm. more than I want him to win with me. And that may mean he has to jump off at some point and not be my co-host on this stream. If I ever felt like me being with Zane on the stream wasn't in his best interest, I would kick him out. I would kick him out. It's like, Dan, I love you. You can't be here anymore. You have to go do that thing. I'm not going to let you stay here. You have to go off and do that thing. It's, it's, even though he's bringing so much value to me, it's actually holding him back. If I felt, I don't feel that way. I think it's great for him. But if I did, I push him away towards the thing that he should be doing. And when you, when you do that, most people only think, what can this person do for me? When you think, what does this person need and how can I help them? Often, again, there's parallel paths. But at some point, some people may have to divert and go do something else. Maybe somebody's with you for life. Maybe somebody's with you for 10 years. Maybe somebody's with you for 10 months or 10 hours and, and they have to go off and do their thing. But while we're together, I'm, I just want you to win as a human. And when people feel that, you get their, not just their brain, but you get their heart and their soul. Yeah. If you're trying to get your journey going on YouTube, cool, take a bite and see, try making videos, try doing vlogs, try doing interviews, try doing direct to camera, try doing speeches, try the things that you see and expect to suck at all of them at the beginning. You're not gonna be good because you don't have the skill set yet. It doesn't mean you suck as a human, you just, you don't have the skill set yet. 
But the thing to pay attention to is, did you enjoy it? How did you feel after doing it? You had that interview and it's easy to go back. If you go back and watch your first interview, it's a train wreck. I mean, you're awkward and nervous and ask the wrong questions and you can look back on it and say, oh my gosh, I should have done that. And you can go over it in your head a million times, but like, but did you like it? You know, like, was it fun to do? Do you want to go back and do it again? Did it give you more energy than it took? And if it's a yes, then that's a great sign to keep going. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people stop on YouTube because they don't get immediate results because they're not doing something that they feel is authentic to them. Um, and they're focused on who they're not serving instead of who they are sure. serving. Um, and they just judge themselves too harshly for not having a skill set yet. Like you don't just get on a snowboard and go down the hill. You fall 80 times on your first run and then you fall 50 times on your second run, right? And you just, you get better as you go. When I go to events, I ask people to give me advice and feedback. The people who I respect on um, my videos, for example. And I'll always leave with, hey, tell me why I suck. Tell me where it sucks. And I know it doesn't suck, but what I'm doing is giving them permission to be honest, to say, okay, here's what I would actually fix. They'll say, hey, Evan, it doesn't suck, but I would fix these, you know, one, two, three things to get the, the real advice. So they're not hiding the truth. But why am I able to do that? Well, because I'm grounded in knowing that the stuff is good. And I'm grounded in knowing that I love the work that I'm, that I'm doing, right? So it allows for the push to go off and do more. The problem becomes is like, you're, why are you going to do more? Is it, is it grounded in, in service and, and kindness and trying to help people? Or is it grounded in, no, because if I get that Lamborghini, it's going to make me look good to people who I don't care about, right? That was it right there. Yeah. Right. So it's like, service but you have to feel connected to the service you have to feel like the thing matters so if you put out this episode and five people watch it or five million people watch it it's i would tell myself that it's having an impact on at least one person that even even this even if you never i've had shows where i'm like their first guest and it never gets published right but hopefully in something i say today maybe it moves you a sheesh right. forward and it has a little spark because i've i've seen it enough where like four years later, five years later, eight years later, we meet at some event and say, you know that thing you told me back in 2022, dude, that like changed everything. Like I've seen enough of that happen that it makes me realize that this is really important. That like this work that I do to help really matters. And I don't think people grow up with a healthy perspective on money. Some people like you alluded to think money is everything. And, and the next person coming in, that's my next purse. And that's my next she's my next suit or she's my next car or whatever. Uh, and money is, is everything. And there's other people though, which I find a lot more in my community who think money is the root of all evil, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually the love of money is the root of all evil, but it gets shortened to money is the root of all evil. And so you're afraid to make money and you think money is bad and money is, it, it, you shouldn't make money. You have to make money. I think money needs to be, in your, especially if you want to be an entrepreneur, money has to be in your top five list of priorities. It just can't be number one, but it's not number 1000 either. Like you have to learn how to monetize and make money because if you want to serve, if you're stuck in some job that you hate and you're only serving for free on the weekends and evenings, you're limited to how much you can help. But if you can turn this into a full-time business and then hire people on your team, and now you've got 10, 20, a hundred people working for you, all aligned to this mission that you're on to save people, right? Imagine the impact you can have because you learned how to make money. It just can't be number one. So the last section of the book talks about how to turn that, those ideas you got, that passion you got, the big heart into something that can actually serve the world, but also make you money. Talk to me a little bit about the service mentality and that service above self mentality that I mentioned, because I feel like it's really um, a part of your core. It's something that you really, really authenticate. So I haven't heard of uh, service above self before, but I'm also not part of Rotary. And um, I think ultimately service is the path to self. I think, I think humans are built to serve. I think if you're not happy, it's because you're not serving. Every day, we all want to wake up and feel like what we do matters to somebody else. We want to feel like the job we're going to or the business we're creating or whatever we're going to do today is going to have an impact on somebody else. And some people you and I, and probably most of your listeners, we want to change the world. We want to have a big impact. We want to go and you know have our message reach wide and far, but not because of us, but because of the impact that we want to create. And other people like my wife, Nina, she doesn't want to have a big mission. 
but she serves the 25 closest people to us. She's the glue for our family. Remember everybody's birthdays and what they're doing and what they need and what they're going through and all of the stuff that I forget <laughs> and, <laughs> and probably I should get better at. But everybody wants to serve. Serving others is hardwired into our brain. They did functional MRIs on people's brains and found that serving other people hits the same part of your brain as having food and having sex. So it's like literally hardwired into your brain that you need this to be a functioning, happy member of society. I think some people um, have experienced things like act of kindness. You know how nice it is to buy the coffee with the person behind you in line or hold the door or those kinds of things. And those moments are great and keep doing them. But I think everybody also has a much deeper level of service where I believe that your purpose comes from your pain that whatever you struggled the most with as a human is what you want to help other people through. And so when you can see somebody who is going through the thing that you went through and feels hopeless and lost and is struggling and doesn't see a way out, and then they spend eight minutes with you and you say, hey, you know what? It's okay. It's like, I went through that too. And here's how to get out. And then you see hope in their eyes for the first time. And like you made that happen, you caused that. And then that's that little, that's a that's a spark in their life that can change the entire trajectory of their life. That's the thing to get addicted to. Like that's what we all want. And I think we're living in a world now where a lot of people find zero meaning in their work. They're driving to a job that they hate. And I'm just trying to ignite some passion in people. Do you think that for people who are looking at making an impact, whether that be online or through content or speaking or any of those different avenues? Where do you see that kind of the next horizon, kind of like you entered YouTube very early on? What do you think's next? So I think it depends on what your mission is, right? So for me, I've got a, a giant mission, right? I want to impact the whole world. And so how do you do that? Well, my hypothesis is that it's content at scale. And if you're going to do content at scale, you've got two options, long form or short form. Like the platforms are basically divided. TikTok and Snap and Facebook and Instagram are all short form content. And then YouTube is long form and YouTube has shorts, I guess, as a combination. But there's YouTube on one side with the long form and all the other content, which is short form. And if, if you want to have an impact and really want to make a difference, I, I think it's hard to do it in 30 second little clips. So that's a lot more inspiring, but it's not really making a huge impact. If you're trying to explain multifamily investing in a 42 second video, <laughs> like good luck, right? So, so, but it's fine. Like the shorts have their own path. It's to inspire, but it's not really to, to do deep education. And you're not really doing any of the deep work just from the clip. So hopefully the clips inspire somebody to start down the path to learn more about this thing. To stop making financial decisions that keep you poor, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Understand your audience at a deep emotional level. And the ask method is all about the nuance of asking the right questions in the right way to the right people. Understand your audience and who they are.